Hi, how's everyone? Thanks for your patience during the swap. Um, so thanks, for, uh, thanks, Peter, for inviting me here. Uh, and, and full disclosure, how many of you are on the Read uh, 20 listserv? OK, cool. Um, I've been lurking there for the past two years. So that sort of informed a little bit about what I'm going to talk about and what I'm going to say. Um, there's definitely moments that I want to choose to highlight about our most recent project, Pry. While I won't be able to get too deep into lessons learned as an artist and independent developer, as well as indie publisher, um, because of time, I'm definitely happy to talk afterwards. At the end of the talk, time permitting, I'm also going to speak a little bit about um, my return to working in VR um, after about 10 years absence. It's a very different and weird space right now and the promises and pitfalls therein and try to tie it back to things we've heard yesterday and today. So um, my, one, my one takeaway, um, especially for people working in the publishing industry, is to uh, lean in. Lean into anything you, that uh, you do that challenges form, that seems unique or difficult. And I find that working in um, across these hybrid forms, half-hearted gesture is the fabric of mediocrity. So I have a trailer for Pride, but for the sake of time, and I think maybe it would be a better um, demonstration of the breadth of the project, I'm going to very quickly take you through it live. So Pry um, is a, a novel. It's an app book. It is a long-form narrative that follows the character of James six years after he returned from the first Gulf War. As the reader, you explore James's mind as his vision fails and his past collides with his present. Pry is an app hybrid of cinema, game, and novel that reimagines how we might seamlessly collide words and images to explore the layers of a character's consciousness. So I'll tell you a little bit about the creation process in a second. Um, what my partner and I wanted to do with this app book was think about um, really marrying form and content and have the gestures that you're working on with the screen resonate the intimacy of the reading process and the intimacy of really positioning you um, within the perspective of this main protagonist. So we use this sort of um, the baseline vocabulary of the pinch gesture as a kind of metaphor also for reading. So in this chapter, I'm doing this live on the app, I can pinch open my fingers and you'll get a um, external video or perspective, sorry the screen's uh, sort of dark, but I can do it in a different chapter, of the character's outside world. In this, in this case, he has sleep paralysis, so he's lying in bed, he's looking up at the ceiling. If I close my fingers in and I bring it down, I can get an underlayer of um, stream of conscious, of impressions and images. And this can happen at any point during the chapters. The user has control over the pinching and the opening. They control the edits. Some of the other interfaces we were, because this is a story really about thought and memory and trauma, and some of the interface, the other interfaces we are working with to dig into the, like, the, um, the you know, uh, to dig into somebody's reluctant memories um, and the process of unfolding and learning is um, the idea of, you know, literally reading between the lines, where we have, the, at this point in the story, it's the crux of the narrative, the character is an unreliable narrator. So he's going to tell you one version of the story, but if you pinch apart, you can pull out um, further. He goes back on what he said. He gets more and more detail. He goes deeper into the text. There's certain parts and certain layers in the narrative where if he doesn't want to address something, then um, it will actually go into this like past, link, uh, past um, legible text and go into this uh, whole like of uh, database of videos and impressions that are associated with the text that are around it. There's about 45 um, minutes of video in this one chapter alone. Um, and they're all, it's all very orchestrated to like hit on specific points in the story. Um, there's several other kind of examples of what we were trying to do with like really the form and materiality of the ebook. Um, one of my, the things I'm interested in, in is this last chapter, which is really a uh, getting a lot of the other characters' voices in here, and it's um, looking at memory that's unyielding, that's repetitive, that's obsessive. It's the infinitely scrolling um, field of text that retells what would have been on the pages of an album that he had that was destroyed. So it's his memory of the album page. And then if you scroll it fast enough, it, it removes from the um, legibility and becomes um, 
memories and impressions. And uh, you can again use the zooming, the idea of zooming to get like the, the legitimate literal idea of what is on the page versus um, digging deeper and going back in sort of time will give you different specific details of story moments associated with that album. And there's a few other methods um, that we're using to tell James's story. And I'll talk a little bit about like how we decided to balance the, um, as media artists who are working in storytelling for a number of years, we kind of consider writing with technology as a symbiosis, right? You're not really putting the technology first and then writing to adapt to that. You're not, um, you can think about story, but it's not that you're like figuring a story and then you're trying to remap it to like a medium as you envision it. You're really going back and forth. There's a push and pull. There's an edit, a constant edit and revision process that goes into this. Um, so to get back to my presentation, okay, is uh, a little bit about who we are and how we came up with this project. So um, Danny and I began working together in 2006. He comes from an animation interaction design through painting. Um, I hold a BA and MFA in writing for interactive media, so I've been thinking about these issues for, for a period of time now. Um, I began writing hypertext and, and text adventures in story space in the early 2000s. And around that time, I also started going into um, research on spatialized narratives by working in a cave, one of the really early VR um, labs that we had at my institution. I've taught at college, um, I usually teach a at the intersection of performance, storytelling, um, digital media, and games. And I'm currently finishing a PhD in VR embodiment games and performance at USC. So since it always comes up, I think the most important part to iterate and uh, for people that I've heard that had questions yesterday were, I come from a background in spoken word and, and writing, right? So like to actually learn how to um, how to storytell in this, in this form was a whole process of learning and discovery. Uh, my, I decided without any experience to throw myself into a required object orienting programming course in the uh, computer science department sometime when I was a junior. And I would not necessarily recommend to go that route. Um, it, was, it was very difficult, but I think it was actually really invaluable because um, even if now for the new work, I don't, I'm not the main developer, I can still having known a little bit um, about, so Pry, I didn't program, my partner programmed, and he learned from free online courses, just straight up Objective-C. And um, having that, that skill and that knowledge in that process has now made us able to find other collaborators and be able to communicate our vision to them, even though we don't currently um, develop our, our newest works. So even though conceptual knowledge and knowledge of the field were essential to make Pry, at the end of the day, the speed of progress and our desire to make something, we couldn't wait for the right developer or funding source to come around. We had to uh, translate and do something that was risky, that stood out. We had to lean in and be open to, uh, to discovering new forms. Um, and usually the second or first question um, comes to me is about, yeah, for, from either literature or film audiences, especially, is uh, how we work with the medium. Um, and as I said before, you know, content should resonate with form. We've had to scrap and repurpose whole pieces of the story that were shot because it made no sense within the interaction or it made no sense with the form and the, um, the arc of the narrative we were trying to say. And uh, also, there were things that, uh, technology that just didn't service the content that we had to go and then like um, redevelop and reimagine like how this character would tell a story, how we would have the user inhabit their space. And, and I find that a lot of times when I'm looking at eBooks, um, if you privilege interaction, you risk falling too far to the side of gimmick or just trying to stuff bonus material into a strong story that ends up with something closer to a DVD extra feature. And the question that I think is important to ask is, what is the added value? Is that enough to carry the project? How does the story need to be told? And why is it interactive? Why does it need to be in the form it's in? Um, that was actually, I'm gonna skip all that side for time, but for those of people who are interested in analog and the process of writing these stories, 
Uh, we were at a residency in McDowell with no access to the internet, no access to technology, and that is how we were originally thinking about mapping parts of Pry. We also did some paper prototyping with the interface, but you can't really see the story until you have, you know, you have the, um, the framing, the technology, how it works together in your hands. You don't know how it will truly come out. Um, so this is sort of a lot of our projects respond to conceptual questions we see in larger culture, and this is why we wanted to make an intervention into this field with a project like Pry. We aren't new to working with books. Um, I have done projects previously in archiving and preservation. Um, books aren't going anywhere. I love the medium. Um, it's got some amazing like affordances and constraints. Um, I actually am really interested in old manuscripts. Um, particularly, I studied the book of Kells for a year. And then in my, um, my, ma my undergrad thesis, Danny and I partnered to create this take on, this was in 2006, on what a book in a browser could be in terms of especially doing a hypertext travel narrative through this, um, the book of Kells uh, that was inspired by the folios of the manuscript and that tied all the different details together, um, both in historical research and in fictional travel narrative. So we had been thinking about the form of this book in this space for some time. Um, however, a tenant and a conceptual point of the work when we think about media and storytelling as like coming from a background in arts is we think about the materials. And I think that's like super awesome that there's been so many iterations over the last two days about affordances and constraints. Like what are the materials you're using? How do they like enhance story? How do they, what are they best at, you know, and, how, um, and using them to tell stories. So this is really a, like the core tenant of what we were trying to do and what we were thinking about with Pry. Some of the things we were responding to in terms of when early ebooks came out is the idea of like skeuomorphic design, which is design, you know, like a design that has like a, a holdover from a previous medium, such as the, t the page turn. Uh, with Pry, how could we like tra traverse the reader from different, from different moments of the story to the others without you know, relying on the metaphor of the page turn? What are other opportunities within that space? Um, also the idea of embedded content versus integrated content. Um, a lot of times we were on a panel with actually people from Penguin that did uh, just put smooth jazz over the story of On the Road. Um, and has like sold it as an augmented ebook for like eight dollars or something, <laughs> and so like a part of um, this sort of the part of the things that we were responding to, you know, in trying to shake it up a little bit with uh, this form. And uh, something I want to touch on briefly in the relation of uh, thinking about actually arcing these narr you know, these narratives, which can be very expansive, is um, coming from hypertext. I decided actually that. Uh, you know, I really do love hypertext and branching narrative, um, but in narrative design, uh, the true freedom of hypertext is actually really authored. Um, you know, that's like sort of the open secret, right? Uh, it's an illusion of freedom. And uh, it doesn't necessarily equal maximum impact for branching narrative. It's really about design and crafting that, those, all those branches to come together. So in our current projects, we're trying to build worlds that feel multifaceted, like you can, you can drill deep into them and they offer those opportunities, but we still maintain a silent guiding hand of the author. Um, and we do that with a, a few subtle tricks in the development. In um, the eye the pinch open, we actually, you, even though the, the reader controls the edits, they can open at any point, we actually, uh, for the eye, when you can look out in the external video, we can do things like have, if you're inside, have the diegetic sound of the world feel like it's continuing, even though when you open it up next, it will hit a plot point that we want you to see. However, even though we structure certain moments that like shape towards the, the narrative, there are still other moments that are missable that fill in extra details about the character or other scenes in the world. Um, so it's one way to like hit certain story beats while also like having like sort of uh, more information on the kind of a flexibility built around that. In the expanded text chapter I showed, we actually programmed, um, so every one of those lines is an exact character length also. Um, so there was a little bit of like a developer magic of how we had to figure out how, how to make this process. And what we did is we wanted, okay, so if you're pinching, if you're opening in like these specific area of the lines, then we want you, um, story point B is the most important and anchoring story point. So we want the reader to encounter that first. Um, so then we can sort of 
algorithmically determine that's what you'll first see um, if you're in a general area. But then if you, can, if you want to get granular, then let's say you want to pinch open between B, B and C, you will, like the sp two specific lines, you will definitively get that story of what you're getting to. You have like that specific line. So it's a way to like shape an overall arc while still giving like the, the illusion of exploration. Um, so for an audience for this type of work, I, I've read a lot about anxieties on, on the listserv um, and we are, now that we're in LA, we're inevitably caught up in this sort of weird, you know, the, the studio system and the structures that are exist within. Um, and there's a lot of concern about eyeballs and like how we have so much data in the collective mire of, you know, like our data brain. Um, but there are times where I wonder about the impact of risk aversion in creating projects like this on a larger culture. It's almost impossible to predict what an audience wants. One thing for sure though is that playing it safe, I feel like quickly gets work lost in that whole, da that whole mire of data. Of data. So I'm not arguing that risk is always a viable business strategy. However, I would say listen to the unusual, the unique, and the difficult when you're planning out these projects. Create an environment where it's possible to actually innovate rather than desiring innovation, but dressing up existing models in extra bling because you need to wait for a new market or a new investment to come through. If you're anxious about possessing skills yourself, find great collaborators and listen some more. Um, we listen to the newly minted college students that are working for us at, at Tender Claws, and then they should listen to the like five-year-olds with iPads, who should then probably listen to like the feed eye, you know, with a ba baby Einstein or whatever. Um, so in the end, I'm here because I'm fortunate how Pry was received. In addition to being named by Apple as one of the uh, 25 best apps of 2015, its quirky category has led it to be featured over five times in both books and games, um, which is an audience that we weren't anticipating. And um, it has always been reviewed as a book, pr it premiered at film festivals and up for game awards. Um, yeah, it's, it's difficult being a hybrid studio and living in the boundaries of these worlds um, and marrying books and browsers. But as media scholars will attest, many of these gestures aren't even new. Um, but I believe our need to create, support, publish, and lean into hybrid work will create islands in the, in the mire that stick out and sustain in the quicksand of fl uh, flow of information. Um, and then finally, I'm not gonna have too much time to touch on this, but I do wanna address this at this conference um, is terms of uh, virtual reality. And I've kind of recently returned to it as a love letter and both a, a curse. Um, I, you know, part of what I do for a living is I study media hype cycles. And it's interesting having come of age uh, when I was very young in the end, like the sort of middle of the nuclear winter VR, right? And um, now where we are. And uh, I see a lot of the same patterns being repeated. And, uh, you know, it, it makes me wonder uh, about you know, how we're destined to repeat these patterns. I think in terms of uh, VR adoption, um, Benjamin Bratton has a great explanation of it being like a staircase where you have like a spike and then like, you know, the people interested will kind of go back and tinker a bit and then it'll be plateau and then another spike of interest and then plateau. And I think that'll kind of be the continuous cycle as we get m more towards a consumer space with this. Um, and the, the Gartner hype cycle, which is, sort of market research which I feel ambivalent about, but it projects like VR as, right now it's at a peak, and then it's, there's always like the, the trough of disillusionment, which I, I like that term, where it's sort of, you know, like investors realize headsets aren't selling as they want to, and then it sort of goes back into a, a little bit of a lull. So I think, you know, in some ways where either, we're, we're about to like edge into that plateau for the next few years, we'll see, you know, it could be the air we breathe, you know. Um, it's very hard to anticipate these things. So our, our next project at Tender Claws is we were um, asked to create a unique portfolio piece to kind of, to kind of um, juxtapose fruit, the Fruit Ninja type VR things um, for Google Daydream. And our challenge in this is really thinking about the materials of the interface of the, of the headset especially how to use the Daydream controller. Daydream was announced um, earlier this month. So uh, 
when I was thinking about producing VR, you know, VR and spatial storytelling, um, I think, yes, I think what we've heard is taking from theater. I, uh, Michael actually had some really amazing points about that earlier. But uh, why, like, why are you putting your story in VR? You know, what is it about, like, the spatial medium that will lend itself to your story? Um, I see so many in LA, I feel like people are just like, oh, it's the next medium, it's like the next 3D TV, and then they like rush out and get a 3D camera without like the critical thinking about like, what does this lend itself to the, how does this lend itself to the content? And I think also it's important to look to games because games are actually probably the most significant audience investment art form and innovative work in media storytelling today. Um, game designers tend to make the best of VR because they really understand the medium of interactivity and agency. In particular, uh, the game company, uh, that game company who created the beautiful peace journey has this idea of rhythms of attention, right? Which is like thinking about what, where the audience's view is um, and where the sort of attention will flow throughout a piece and how you as an author or director can like subtly from like, um, sometimes they have like whispering sands very subtly, like guide the flow of attention in the story. Um, I would say it's a good time to lean into R&D and, and VR. Uh, however, I don't believe that we can set a vocabulary of how we're gonna approach things and everything will stabilize. I think this sort of medium is constantly in flux and constantly evolving. So I think that like R&D is a good, like a long-term strategy is probably not as strong as like really experimentation right now. So finally, I'll leave you with our experiment and our attempt to um, design a spatial narrative for this medium. It is a project that's gonna be announced in two weeks. It's not public yet. And this is a very early uh, preview of some of the things we're working on. It's called Virtual Virtual Reality, and it's a sat satiric uh, comedy and love letter to the form virtual reality, where you take on and put off virtual reality headsets in virtual reality to escape through a system as a, your AI task rabbit manager attempts to hunt you down. Sorry about that. Okay, well, thank you.